Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are, as has been said, two years exactly from Independence Day, and in less than six months, each one of us will be asked to take a decision that will reverberate, reverberate down the ages in Scotland. On September the 18th, the power to enact a simple and honest choice on a landmark ballot paper proposition will see us go face to face with our future as well as our past. Yes or no, it's as simple as 177 sleeps separating our children from their children's destinies. You and I will be saying, I trust Scotland's people, those who live and work here, to make the decisions about our country's future. Yes, it is a vote for Scotland's future, for ourselves, for our children, and for generations not yet born. But also those generations past that make us who we are, wherever our journeys began from. Standing on the shoulders of giants, we are saying we believe in our own ability, the ability of the people in Scotland from every community and every background to make the best choices for Scotland. Yes will mean that our Parliament will have the responsibility for all aspects of our national life, not just those devolved to it by Westminster. Fundamental everyday decisions about the economy, welfare, taxation, and whether or not we spend billions maintaining weapons of mass destructions on the Clyde will be taken here in Scotland. This principle that decisions about Scotland are best taken in Scotland has already been proven to work. We already take our own decisions on health, education and justice, and I'm sure most people will agree that that has brought real benefits. Independence will extend these benefits, and Scotland has got what it takes. As we move forward in this year of yes, the momentum is undoubtedly with us on the yes side. The latest panel-based poll putting yes at 47 and no at 53, excluding the don't knows, with a swing of just 3% required for yes to win. The world is watching and waiting, and Scotland is ahead of the curve. Now, I'm sure many of you may have been asked the question that I'm often asked, which is, but Tasmina, where do you really come from? Well, my father was born in India, left in 1965, meeting my Welsh, my Welsh mother in London. I was born in Chelsea, and my family moved to Edinburgh, where I was brought up. I married in Glasgow and have four children here. With a journey like that, I believe I was fundamentally destined to be a Scot. Scotland has embraced my family, and now it's time for Scotland to determine its own immigration policy. A recent Scottish Green Party poll indicated that 66% of those asked want this to be the case. Evidence is a consensus that exists and understands immigration as formative of Scotland's society and essential to dynamic social and economic prosperity. A stance completely at odds with UKIP, who have no traction in Scotland, yet are pandered to by the Tories who thought there was a place in Scotland for the border agency's go-home vans. That's not the Scotland I know. It doesn't stop there. With David Cameron set to announce benefits will be stripped from immigrants who can't speak English, and Labour set to make those claiming unemployment supports the English tests. Immigrants come to Scotland to work and contribute to the economy, and Westminster treats them with contempt and independent Scotland can do so much better. And we can afford to do better, as we already rank 14 amongst the world's wealthiest countries, and our finances are already stronger than the UK by £1,600 per person. We have generated more tax per head in the last 33 years and spend a smaller share of our wealth in taxes on welfare and pensions. The Financial Times analysis pointed to figures showing we would be one of the top 35 exporters in the world and we could expect to start off our life as an independent country with healthier finances than the rest of the UK. In a world where cross-border politics begin and end with sovereign debt and deficit rankings, the biggest beast of all, Standard & Poor's, has not cowed Barroso style to Downing Street. Without hiding behind the hypotheticals of the old guard, Standard & Poor's has already confirmed that even excluding North Sea oil output Scotland would qualify for the highest ratings assessment. Our only challenge would therefore be to ensure we make that wealth work better for our people. We can be certain of one thing, and that's our taxes will not be used 
to pay for nuclear weapons as we will remove Trident from Scotland for good. Investing in our people and our children, that's the best form of national security that exists. An independent Scotland can invest our oil wealth for future generations. Norway now has a saving funds worth £470 billion, and we can do that too. Although, better together would have us believe that Scotland is the only country in the world where oil and gas is a burden, and then go on even further to suggest we aren't up to the job of managing it anyway. Well, what a great job they've done. Collectively, whether Tory or Lib, Lab Lib Labour Coalition and campaign bedfellows, they are responsible for an abject failure to save a single penny of the 300 billion of tax revenues that have flowed from the Treasury. With independence, we would have a more stable long-term policy as we manage these resources for our children. The Scottish Government's white paper outlines its vision for independence. The possibilities and opportunities of independence, including radical improvements in childcare provision, working to bring up to the highest European standards, giving our children the best start in life and making it easier for parents to get back into the workplace. With independence, we can guarantee that the minimum wage will rise in line with inflation. We will support the living wage and also take action to ensure the lowest paid are treated fairly and that work is a route out of poverty. Our recent Oxfam report detailed the ever-widening inequality that exists and showed five of the richest families in the UK own more wealth than the bottom 20% of the whole population. With independence, we and not West Westminster would be responsible for implementing the Equal Pay Act, which was passed some 44 years ago, yet we still have a significant gender pay gap. This is a failure of the current system. It's a reason to vote for independence and give ourselves the power to succeed where Westminster has failed. So as we enter the home straight, I ask you to think about three important words, and they are can, should, and must. Scotland can be independent. Scotland should be independent. Scotland must be independent. And I'll add a fourth one, will. The referendum is a choice between two futures and the independence white paper spells out what a yes vote will mean for Scotland. There is no equivalent detail from the no side. Indeed, the polls show three-fifths of the Scots electorate don't believe a word the divided unions claim to pledge so vaguely about our future. Many of the consequences of voting no are clear. Let us be clear what that means. There is no guarantee that Scotland will remain in Europe, no guarantee we will get the governments we vote for, and no guarantee for any more powers for the Scottish Parliament. After all, there is no agreement on more powers within the different no parties, let alone between them. Labour's devolution commission proposals don't acknowledge the worsening structural equalities that disfigure our national life. It overpromised and undelivered on promises last year to devolve all income tax and air passenger duty. Reform Scotland's analysis confirms that under Labour's proposals, responsibility for 80% of taxes raised here are to rest with Westminster, and 85% of welfare responsibilities to rest with Westminster. This leaves vital job-creating and welfare powers in the hands of a Tory Chancellor we didn't vote for, but for whom, incidentally, Ed Balls will vote with this week, supporting Osborne's welfare cap a cap in spending which will have disproportionate impact on women. I'm sure it will come as little surprise to Scottish Labour that according to last week's panel-based poll, currently 27% of Labour voters who voted for them in 2011 are going to vote yes in the referendum. Indeed, former Labour Party Chairman Bob Thompson said, we have to choose a different path. Neither the current Westminster Coalition nor London Labour is offering anything other than the continuing austerity and more pain for those in society who are already hurting badly. With a no vote, our budget will be under threat as there are demands from senior politicians in all of the no parties to scrap or reform the Barnett formula which provides the funding basis for Scotland at a potential cost to us of nearly four billion. On the 18th September, the Scottish people will be in charge. How we vote will determine whether we stay in charge or hand power back to the Westminster establishment. It is the only opportunity we are guaranteed to get to decide our own future. Imagine how we'll feel on the 19th with the eyes of the world upon us if we fail to make, take this once in a lifetime opportunity. September 2014 will be one of the greatest moments in Scottish history. And I believe that when people arrive at polling stations this year and hold that ballot paper and a piece of Scotland's future and past in their hand, they will vote 
for Scotland. Voting yes keeps us in the driving seat of our own destiny. It allows us to forge a new and exciting nation. I know where I stand. I hope you will stand with me for yourselves, your children, and the future of our country. Our time is here, our time is now. Our future is ours to take, and we must seize it. Thank you. We've got a long night ahead of us, and there's going to be a lot of questioning and a lot of opportunity to sort of pick at the bones as skeptics uh, of all that the panelists will say. Uh, I'm not going to deliver a polemic here. I haven't got a huge prepared text. I hope just to speak to you sincerely. I mean, what does a Tory say to an audience in the centre of Glasgow other than good night and goodbye? <laughs> <laughs> Albeit. Albeit a West of Scotland Glaswegian Tory who's lived in and around the city and worked here all his life. <laughs> uh, and who's long old enough to remember when we had two members of parliament in my political lifetime and actually ran the council in Glasgow in the 1970s. Uh, this vote, if it were a vote on September the 18th about whether Scotland loves the Tories, well, I'd concede defeat before we start. Uh, maybe if the referendum had been 50 years ago, uh, that would be different, and I'm an optimist. Maybe if it were in 50 years' time, it would be different again. But if it's a vote about the Conservatives on September the 18th, then I accept it's lost. But independence isn't about the Conservatives. It's not about David Cameron. It's not about Alex Salmon. Long after they are gone, if we voted to be an independent nation, we will still be an independent nation. And the reasons that we have to come to as individuals, personally, in our own account, have to go far higher and far wider, far deeper than our love or dislike of any political individual or any political party at any given moment in Scotland's history. Now, I'm an optimist. I'm a proud Scot. I believe in Scotland's future. I accept it's not a centre-right future that I live in or I'm fighting for at the moment, but I believe that whatever the decision Scotland comes to in September, as a country, we will make a success of that. I've attracted some criticism for being bold enough to say that if Scotland votes to be independent, then as a proud and patriotic Scot, we'll do everything I can with heart, head, passion to fight for the best possible future for Scotland. But I believe in the United Kingdom. I believe in all that we've actually managed to achieve both as a country, using words that some people might find strange from a Tory and a country that I think is more equal, is better, is fairer, is stronger than it was when the countries of the Union came together all that time ago, and which I think has contributed and continues to contribute in the world. You know, if it hadn't been for Scotland, then the rest of the United Kingdom would have taken military action over Syria. It was the votes of Scottish MPs that actually tipped the balance in the United Kingdom, which through the decision we took, tip the balance in the rest of the democratic world against a military intervention. As part of the United Kingdom, we exercise and continue to exercise a great strength, a moral strength, because we bring something different to the United Kingdom as Scots from the other countries that are there. As a conservative, actually, in this debate, I find to my surprise that my party is surprising itself with its embracing an appetite now for constitutional change. As the party that was most for devolution in the 70s and then turned its back on it, curiously we now find that this is a moment when Scotland, whatever the outcome of the referendum, if it chooses to stay within the United Kingdom, will not go on in a business-as-usual footing. We accept that the best of both worlds, if it's to be meaningful, has to mean that Scotland has a greater say over more of its domestic agenda than it's had previously. So, although the different unionist parties have got different philosophies and perspectives, we are united in our belief that our future is within the United Kingdom. What that future is, is very, very different to all three of us. I don't believe that Scotland, as a skeptic, will just land on its feet as an independent nation. One of the things that's most distressed me in this is, is the kind of very evangelistic approach to independence, as if it's a risk-free alternative. I've never seen a new nation created that was risk-free. That doesn't mean it's not worth taking the risk, but I think it does mean people should 
step back and ask, you know, through all the difficulty that we would go through, it would be a long time before we were really back where we are today. And there have been lots of questions asked over the last two years, which was meant, remember, this referendum to be the long campaign it has been, because it was going to substantially answer to your satisfaction all the material points on which you have to decide. And yet I think what most people have come to realize is that there is a huge uncertainty. And we've not had an honest debate because one side says there is no uncertainty. Everything is going to happen just as we say it will, despite all the different organizations, countries, businesses, and others who are challenging those certainties. The polls have suggested this is a foregone conclusion. I've never thought that. The next three months, the next six, but particularly the last three months, will be when people have to finally come to a decision on their own account. I'm not sure you will actually know much more than you know now. It is a question of deciding where does the best future for you, your children, lie. As I say, I disagree with Jackie and Willie on what that vision for Scotland would be like if we stayed within the Union. But I do believe that the United Kingdom offers us the best of both worlds. It offers us that opportunity to continue to have a voice that reaches far beyond Scotland's shores. But it is also a moment in time when I believe Scotland will have the opportunity through the Scottish Parliament to have a far greater say and to develop a far greater say over our own agenda. I'm a Glaswegian. I'm a Scot. I'm a Brit. I'm not a Scandinavian. Uh, it's all very well looking to Scandinavia and saying we could be one of these Scandinavian nations. We can't be. We're not Scandinavians. Essentially, we're Brits. You know, we have a different relationship with alcohol to Scandinavia. We don't need an independent, to be an independent nation to change that. We are the character of our history. I'm a Glaswegian. I'm a Scot. I'm a Brit. I'm proud of all of those things. And on September the 18th, I'm not asking you to vote for the status quo. I'm asking you to vote for a Scotland that will become more confident, a Scotland that will be the only nation in the United Kingdom to have voted to be there, a Scotland that will stand taller within the United Kingdom, a Scotland that will be able in the United Kingdom not to be able to be told by others that they're there in sufferance, but to be able to say, we're here because we voted to be here. We want to influence the rest of the world and the rest of the United Kingdom through our culture, our history, our beliefs. But at the same time, we want to demonstrate through the Scottish Parliament what we can be on the domestic agenda that responds to the intuitive beliefs and substance of the Scottish people. So I'm asking you on September the 18th to vote not for, not for the status quo, but to vote for a change, but a change within the United Kingdom. I want to thank you, first of all, for the invitation to take part in this <coughs> event and how impressed I am at the huge turnout. I've spoken at a number of skeptics events in the past and I've found them to be engaging and stimulating and challenging and I think it's a really important movement, the movement for evidence-based policy. Because let's begin with an admission. My profession, politics, our political culture for which we all as citizens have a responsibility is rubbish at evidence-based policy. <laughs> and I think... Whether we're talking about allowing the Daily Mail to run our drugs and criminal justice policy, or uh, actually taking seriously the arguments of somebody like Donald Trump uh, on energy, or uh, indeed both governments, Scottish and UK, repeatedly saying how enthusiastic they are about the mission to extract and burn every last drop of oil from the North Sea, when we know our species has the intelligence to have figured out that we cannot afford to burn the vast majority of the fossil fuels that we have on the planet. We've got something like four or five times more fossil fuels than we can afford to burn if we want to hand on a habitat, an environment which is uh, acceptable for the, the quality of life of future generations or even uh, for people who are living with the consequences of climate change right now. We're setting targets, but we're not putting the action in place to meet those targets. Uh, and we're still allowing an economy that's dominated by fossil fuels and dependent on, economically dependent on the fossil fuel industry.
So would independence suddenly transform our political culture, make us more evidence-based and rational? No, of course not. So how to make a decision about that? How to make a decision if you're undecided, if you want to test the arguments about independence? Well, you could look at Westminster and Holyrood's political culture and think of them as, as single parties, the Westminster Party and the Holyrood Party, and figure out which one's got the better track record. Well, the Westminster Party has consistently, over changes of uh, government, commodified and priced higher education, turned higher education into something which you can only embark on if you're willing to start your life with tens of thousands of pounds of debt before you've even got your first job. The Holyrood Party consistently, whatever actual political party has been running the show, has rejected that agenda and has tried to, to do what we can to prevent that from happening. I'm not saying we've got everything right, but there's a good track record. The Westminster political party, I think, has a track record of undermining our civil liberties in a way that hasn't been done uh, by the Hollywood party. The Westminster political party, in my view, has a track record of allowing chronic inequality to grow, while the Hollywood party has done what it can. It can't do enough yet to try and uh, track that, to try and check that trend. The evidence that people have sought, and I think Jackson said that the, the long debate was intended to produce all the evidence and answer all the questions. In many ways, this is not a mechanistic choice that anyone can make. You can go online and find reams of information, reams of argument, reams of evidence and statistics on both sides of this debate. This is not a contest over who can produce the biggest pile of argumentation. At the end of the day, you have to make a judgment. And you're going to have to make that judgment on the basis of your values, every bit as much on the basis of your evidence. If you share the value that I, I believe most people in Scotland uh, would say yes to, if you share the, the value of working for a more equal, more sustainable, fairer society, one in which we don't rely on, on dependence on bubble industries, whether that's uh, subprime debt or fossil fuels, which is every bit as much a dangerous economic bubble. If you want a society where we close the gap between rich and poor, where we build a sustainable future for our society, where we think about the kind of direction our country's economy could go in, ask yourself, what do we need to start enacting that? What, do we, what powers do we need? Can we do that with the current powers of the Scottish Parliament, where we've got responsibility for managing debt, but we can do nothing to deal with credit, to regulate credit, where we've got responsibility uh, for energy efficiency, but we can't regulate the energy companies, where we have everywhere the fragmented uh, little shreds of, uh, of, of power. Sometimes we've got responsibility without power. Can we rely on Westminster to make the transformational change in our economy, our society, and our politics that we need if not only our country uh, but we're going to contribute to the world, surviving uh, the ecological crisis that we've already created. I just don't see that happening. I look at the Westminster track record, and I don't see the potential for the kind of change that we need. You will not hear from me tonight, and I don't think anyone's heard from me during this debate, the idea that independence is risk-free, or that it offers only certainty. Life is uncertain. All of life contains uncertainty. And I think a scientifically literate audience will understand that. Voting yes, voting no, these are both balances of risks and opportunities. Don't listen to anyone who tells you there's no risk. Don't listen to anyone who tells you there's no opportunity. Weigh the two up. In my mind, the opportunities outweigh the risks, and that's why I'm voting yes. Um, can I say to Tasmina and to all of you at the very outset, you know, I trust... Scotland's people. I trust them to make a decision that's based on the head as well as the heart. I trust them to deliver the kind of balance that Patrick has argued for this evening. But to question assertion, to probe assumptions, to look beyond the rhetoric, and you will hear a lot of it, but to do what skeptics do best. But to do that in the interest, not just of us, because this is a decision that has an everlasting impact on our children and our grandchildren. So we need to get this right. Now, I came into politics 
because I fundamentally believe in a fairer society. The values that continue to motivate me are social justice, equality, and solidarity. My debate is framed by those values, but the debate framed by the SNP is more about identity and the Constitution. Do you know, I have more in common with someone in Newcastle or Birmingham or Liverpool or Manchester than I do a Highland Laird or an Edinburgh banker. So for me, this is about the division between class and community and not, frankly, about nationalism or identity. The answer to every question posed by the SNP is independence. It actually doesn't matter what the question is. When Labour was creating the NHS, the answer from the SNP was independence. When Labour was creating the welfare state, the answer from the SNP was independence. When Labour were creating the national minimum wage, the answer from the SNP was independence. Now, I have enormous respect for Patrick, and he and I agree on very many things, but I've got to be honest with him, it's unlikely to be the Greens that form the next government. It is likely to be the SNP, and Alex Salmond has described the white paper as the SNP's manifesto for independence. So we do need to examine their proposals quite closely. And I want to focus my comments on tackling poverty because there is no greater cause for me than eradicating child poverty. Labour lifted a million people out of poverty, a million children out of poverty, 200,000 of them in Scotland alone. And we know that this was at a time where the scale of poverty was declining, but the impact we had in Scotland was greater than anywhere else in the United Kingdom. That was about political will, that wasn't about flags or borders or the Constitution. Progress is now stalling, and under the Conservatives, it's starting to go the other way. But simply because we may reject what the Conservatives are doing is no reason to reject the United Kingdom and separate Scotland from it. Now, the SNP will promise you much on welfare. We've all heard those promises. But you know, you need to know them by their actions. One billion pounds stripped from anti-poverty budgets, swinging cuts to public services so that we now have 49,500 fewer public sector workers, the majority of them women. And then when they have the power over issues like the Scottish Welfare Fund, that fund is underspent and they cannot get the money out the door at a time where the need is self-evident. Shame on them. But they promise instead tax cuts to big companies. Doesn't matter what George Osborne does with corporation tax, the SNP will cut it 3% lower. There is nothing progressive about that. That is a race to the bottom. Opportunities to tackle low pay by building in the living wage to the procurement reform bill, completely missed. Amendments rejected. Nothing progressive about that. And then an abject refusal to sign up to a suggestion from Labour of a 50% tax rate so that those with the broadest shoulders bear the biggest burden. Nothing progressive about that either. Tasmina, I can say to you, oil has made a positive difference to this country. It's created jobs. You only need to look at the Northeast to see the truth of that. But it is volatile. It is declining. There is a fiscal deficit projected of £12 billion last year, and it's set to rise in the future. There is no answer for the fiscal deficit. Let's just pretend it's not happening. But the reality is, whatever the constitutional outcome, we need to deal with this. The Institute of Fiscal Studies, if you want evidence, said that on an 8 billion deficit, not 12, but 8, we would require an 8% cut in public services or a 9% rise in taxes. We cannot deny that. We need to face up to that and deal with it. But the one thing I do know is you cannot have Scandinavian-style welfare on US-style taxation. And it's about time there was some honesty in the debate about that. 
Let me just touch on the bedroom tax because there was, there was an example where we had the power in the Scottish Parliament to do something about it. I reject the bedroom tax. I dislike what the Tories have done and I hope that they abolish it with immediate effect. But we had the power to mitigate it. But for the best part of the year, the government said they wanted not to let Westminster off the hook. But instead, they put the ordinary people of Scotland on the hook by not helping them at a time where they were running up arrears and under considerable stress. It was exactly times like these that I voted for a Scottish Parliament to take action, um, to do the right thing. And I am very pleased that actually, when you see the SNP and Labour working together, that is exactly what we've done. We have effectively, by fully mitigating it, abolished the bedroom tax in Scotland. So let me say to you, voting no is not a vote for no change. I believe devolution is an evolving journey, and I do want to see a stronger and growing Scottish Parliament. But I am very much proud of Scotland. I'm proud of its people. My values, though, are founded on social justice, fairness, and equality. It's what I fought my whole life for. But I do believe in the best of both worlds, a strong and growing Scottish Parliament, but the security and stability of being part of the United Kingdom. Thank you. I want to make three main arguments uh, in these introductory comments, and they're aimed deliberately at those of you in the audience who may yet be undecided. The three arguments are the following. The first is the track record of Westminster and its incapacity to change, not just what it's done wrong, but an analysis of why it can't change and why it's systemically corrupt in the sense that it breeds inequality and in the sense that there's a disparity of power so great now that whether you live in Scotland or London, you are a million miles away from those who dominate that particular institution politically. The second, that democracy is fundamental to this debate and that Britain as a political unit no longer makes sense. And the third, about what this debate is not about. It's not about national identity, it's not about patriotism, and it's not about how proud you feel to be Scottish yeah. or otherwise. It's yeah. about political power. <laughs> so on to the first argument. We have suffered decades of neglect. Decades of neglect, not by an act of nature, but by an act of design. The neoliberal consensus that binds the politics of Westminster is not pregnable because the political forces that dominate that institution are tied organisationally and operationally to the city of London. It's tied to big finance and it's tied to the financial services which dominate our economy. That's one of the reasons why we've seen, for example, inequality increase to such huge levels. Now, they say the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and it's not just a cliche. I'll give you an example. The top 200 wealthiest people in Britain have a combined wealth of £318 billion. But you might like to also know that that combined wealth has increased by 10 times since 1989. Again, not an act of nature, but an act of design. We have the second lowest pay amongst the advanced economies in Europe. We have some of the worst rates of child poverty in the industrialised world. And what a scandal it is that given the resources that we have in this country, we still have pensioners every winter who die as a result of choosing between heating and eating. That is a scandal, not just in Scotland, but right around Britain, but again, by design. Now, we can say something about Tory and Labour governments, and we'll hear arguments today about how there are differences. And sure, there may well be some differences, but let's talk about, for example, the privatisation of the NHS in England. Let's not forget who started the process who provided the context and the framework for that privatisation to take place, it was the Labour Party with the Foundation Hospitals. This is a fact. This, is, this, shows you, this shows you that there is a link between those two parties. Now, Jackie may well say that she's more in common with a working class person in Glasgow than a banker in, in London and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is that the Labour government, whenever we've elected one, has had far more in common with the Bernie Ecclestons of this world and with the George Bushes of this world than they ever had with the working class people they sent off to die and kill in Iraq. So let us not hear, let us not hear tonight 
the fallacy that Labour stands up any longer for working class people because you know what? Working class people now have clicked. They don't. Now, let's say something else briefly on this before I move on to the second point. Why does Westminster operate in the interest of the rich? Is this just rhetoric? Can we analyse this and, and say that actually there is something more operational to its, to its uh, politics and to its operation? I argue that because of the link that the political parties in Westminster have with corporations, because not just of a revolving door between heads of corporations that turn into then heads of government, and not just because you have an Etonian elite, from when they are birthed, they are then raised to rule over us, but because actually that is what the political system runs like when you have a neoliberal consensus. Neoliberal consensus means that you privatise, that, uh, that you have a process of austerity, that you cut back on social security, that you atomise people, and it also means things like zero hours contracts. These are the things which people really care about, and these are the things that are really part of the debate. The second point, moving on quickly. We have one Tory MP in Scotland, and this is a well-known phrase, but I want to argue something tonight. I want to say that this is profound. It's not just that we've got more pandas than Tories and all of these kind of things, funny as they are, true as they are, but actually this is profound. It says something profound about our democracy, that we have a cabinet who is not just shaping this generation, but who is putting into process and implementing an economic plan and a political agenda that will fundamentally alter the relationship that working people have with politics for decades to come. That's what we're faced with, and we didn't vote for them. That's profound. And if you did vote Lib Dem, it doesn't matter where you live. <laughs> because you were sold out. Britain, therefore, doesn't make sense as a political unit. We have UKIP on the rise in England, but they can't save a deposit in Scotland. UKIP make the political agenda in terms of the question of Europe in England, but not in Scotland. Why can't we have these questions not decided by the policies of parties? Why can't we put the benefit that comes from social security, the welcome that you should receive if you come to this country and you are seeking refuge, why can't we have these rights enshrined in a constitution? Why can't instead of our public services being stripped back by Westminster, instead of that, why can't we shift the paradigm completely and fight for a constitution which guarantees these rights to everyone, regardless of what government's in. I think that's one of the reasons that we should vote yes. I think that's one of the reasons which means that the democratic argument for Britain is so weak and the democratic argument for yes so strong. And one more point about this. This debate, this meeting, this process already proves that the referendum process itself, which let's not forget many people didn't want to see in the first place. Many people still don't. But this process itself is actually encouraging a democratic renewal. We are seeing people from all over the political spectrum, and we are seeing people who have been disengaged with politics for so long now beginning to get involved and coming along to meetings like this. Imagine what that would be like if we won a yes vote. If we won a yes vote, and each and every one of us had the possibility of shaping our future. Now, the last point that I want to make, as I said at the start, is that I don't think that this debate is about national identity, about patriotism, about how Scottish you feel, about how different you might feel to a Scandinavian. It's about none of those things. And really, we should, at a meeting like this and at a gathering like this, expect a higher standard of argument. Because what this really is about is about political power and about political trajectory. Now, there is risk attached to a yes vote. I would argue, though, that the risk is far more with staying. The risk is with staying, because if we stay, we keep trident. If we stay, we are going to be bound by American foreign policy. If we stay, we are going to see more austerity and more privatization. It's about trajectory. Now, the trajectory that we stay locked into, the paradigm that we stay locked into, if we vote no, if we miss this opportunity, is one that is going to increase, intensify, perpetuate the sort of process that we've seen over the last three decades in this country, where economic and political power has become further and further away from ordinary people. A yes vote is the opposite. A yes vote is not a magic wand. A yes vote does not mean that when you vote yes, you then go home and fold your arms. You do the opposite. We vote yes, and the day after, we are on the streets, we are having meetings, we are having these kind of forums, but the question is not should we be independent or not at that stage. It's what sort of constitution should we have. The last point I want to make in this before I sum up. One of the arguments that's often put to me and to many of the people that's involved in the radical independence campaign is, 
well, you've got some good ideas, and you know, the conferences were nice and so on, but it's the SNP who's going to be in power. And when the SNP are in power, what are you going to do then? Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do what we always do. We'll campaign. Well, we'll always do what working people have always done, whether it was the poll tax, whether it was anti-war movement, whether it was a minor strike. Well, it doesn't matter what it was. We believe in the capacity of ordinary people to mobilize, to self-organize, and to create political change. In that sense, we stand in the great traditions of not just uh, movements in Scotland, but right across the world, where people power has brought to bear serious degrees of influence. I must admit, I thought that the first time that I would ever have the chance to debate leaders of the no opposition here might be when we get into Parliament. But actually, we're showing that influence comes from the bottom up. It comes from the bottom up if you're in touch with people on the ground. And I think that far too many of our politicians, but in particular, far too many of those in Westminster and in the Cabinet, uh, may as well live in a different planet. And they do live in a different planet. They don't have to struggle like ordinary people do have to struggle. And therefore, my last and concluding point is this. If you're undecided, if you're sitting here and you're trying to balance up the arguments, you're thinking critically about this debate, I think that there's one important thing uh, to bear in mind throughout the whole thing. Don't take what the media says for granted. Now, I don't think the media has conducted this debate well at all. Don't take the media for granted. Come along to meetings like this. Interrogate those on the yes side as well as those on the no side. That's where you're going to find out the real crystallization of the argument. And that's why I hope I've attempted to provide tonight and in these opening remarks for those of you in particular who are undecided. I actually do agree that this independence referendum has energized political debate in Scotland. And I think that is something for the good. We understand, I think, more about our country, its strengths and its weaknesses. It's brought some great realism, actually, I think, to the debate about our constitutional future. And that's something that I welcome. And whatever happens in September, I think we will be better fitted, we'll be better suited to decide our future going forward. There'll be more people engaged in the process, and I think that is a good thing, because for years it has been heading in the opposite direction. If this is the kind of renewal that we can expect, I welcome it, and I think that's something that all political parties will welcome as well. Look, I'm not a supporter of independence, as you would gather. I do find it odd, however, with Jonathan. He's a passionate, passionate speaker for his cause. But I do find it odd the change in direction for the, the socialist movement, that somehow only socialism should be here for Scotland, that he's somehow given up on the fight in the rest of the United Kingdom. I think I'm disappointed that, that he has given up in that respect, that he's not actually engaging the debate on a UK-wide basis. And that's something I know that has been quite a heated debate within the socialist uh, movement. But I do find that, that people in Manchester Newcastle, Leeds, and so on. I'm not a socialist, but I find it odd that Jonathan has given up on that battle. I was, um, he talked about the Liberal Democrats, um, but I was grateful, I have to say, for Alex Salmon's endorsement at the last election, because I think that shows, that shows in reality that sometimes we all have different views at different times, and we should recognize the decisions that we make in the past. As a liberal, I believe in the power of individuals, their innate ability. I share that passion, that desire, that impatience for change. I'm a reformer. I want things to change in the United Kingdom. But I simply do not believe that drawing more lines on a map will automatically change that. I just don't believe that that would be the case. I believe in the ability of people. I believe in the ability of the Scottish people to change, but I do not recognize that simply creating an independent Scotland will automatically make things better. That doesn't mean I'm uncritical of the United Kingdom. I've criticized many of the decisions that have been made by the UK Parliament in the past. Probably like many people in this room, I was against the Iraq war. I was against that, but I do not simply believe that breaking up the country will automatically prevent such future wars. We need to remember that it was the Scottish Parliament that voted for the Iraq War back then. To my disgust, we voted against the Iraq War, but the Scottish Parliament voted for it. 
we need to recognise the frailty in our own decision-making as much as the frailty in the United Kingdom decision-making. The, I think we also, in this context, need to recognise the good things. Because we've heard many of the bad things about the United Kingdom, and some of them I wouldn't necessarily disagree with, as I say. But we need to recognise some of the good things that the United Kingdom does and has done. The fact that we've got the second biggest aid budget, international aid budget in the world, recognised globally for delivering humanitarian aid and support to far-flung parts of the world. When they do. I'm proud that Britain does that. It shows a compassion globally that I think we should endorse and do even more of. The fact that we created the NHS free at the point of delivery, the state pension, welfare state, I recognise, going through change, but still a great safety net in the United Kingdom. These things the United Kingdom has done, they go through changes, but they are still good things. And we need to recognise that even if we are opponents of the United Kingdom, as I suspect many in the room are, we do need to recognise the United Kingdom has and still does many, many good things. We also need to recognise the great unions, because there's many great partnerships across the UK. Look at the financial and economic union we've got one of the most successful currency unions that the world has ever seen. That is something we need to recognise. It's brought the stability, the broad-based economic base upon which we can make decisions about funding of the NHS, the state pension and international aid. The energy union that means that British consumers right across the UK are funding the advance in renewable energy right here in Scotland. That's a great thing we need to recognise is good, is happening, and that is something we should support. The fact that we've got open travel right across the United Kingdom, that is something we need to recognise as being a good thing and it's been there for 300 years. The research union that funds our top class universities is something, again, we need to recognise as a good thing that the United Kingdom has done. And there is no doubt, I mean, actually Patrick and Jonathan, to their credit, recognise that there will be uncertainty with this transition to an independent country. And my response to Patrick is, why would we compound the uncertainty that we have in the world every day with even more uncertainty that would be guaranteed to come? Now, I'm not saying that all the problems that people have thrown at the independence argument would all be true. I reject many of the arguments. Some of them, I think, are trivial. But what I do recognise is we need to focus on the degrees of uncertainty that would be there. And finally, on devolution. Devolution, I regard as a success. We've got more power decision-making in Scotland. I think it's almost universally accepted now, despite the critics at the time, that the Scottish Parliament has been a success. And we've shown that the United Kingdom, through that, can change. It can release power, despite what the critics say. And we have delivered more since devolution, more powers on rail and other powers as well, and the Scotland 2012 Act coming through. And then all the parties, the Conservatives, Labour and the Liberal Democrats, have promised to deliver more powers as well, because we recognise there's something missing about the Scottish Parliament. The fact that we cannot have the power to control the finances in the way that we would like, Accepting a grant from Westminster does not give you full control over the purse strings, so you don't have the full autonomy that the Scottish Parliament needs to make decisions on the domestic agenda while having the great backstop of the United Kingdom. Now, I suspect there are many supporters of independence in the hall, but I would just urge you to look at some of the benefits that the United Kingdom has. It is not all black and white. There are benefits to the United Kingdom and actually recognising those benefits would actually enlighten this debate in a way that I think it has been enlightened, as Jonathan recognised at the beginning. The fact that we know more about our country now is a good thing. And I think it's important that all parties from all sides recognise the strengths and weaknesses in every single argument. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. My name is Patrick Rowling. I'm from Airdrie. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of quick points. Um, Jackie Bailey talked about well, we've managed to mitigate the bedroom tax. We haven't managed to abolish it. That's what this debate's about. Will there any great speech, compassion, all the money we're spending international aid? I wish you showed the same compassion with all the people suffering from the bedroom tax. 
another big bone of contention with us. But those are only opinions. I'm going to give you a couple of facts now. 1983, I had to move to London to work. 30 years on, my daughter's having to do the same. 1973, the Children's Bureau released a report about the shocking levels of child poverty in the UK. 50 years on, they released a similar report last year, and there are more people living in poverty. If the union hasn't worked for all those people in the last 50 years, why will it work in the future? Yeah, I specifically dealt with child poverty, and it was labour across the United Kingdom, both in Scotland and in the UK, that lifted a million children out of poverty. I thought that was a significant achievement, but frankly, it wasn't enough because the levels of child poverty are too high. In a country with the resources that we have, we should be focusing far more on lifting children out of poverty. I think it's a scandal that we are now seeing the numbers going in the wrong direction. It's not a vision I share at all with Jackson. I, you know, I do hope that the Tories reverse some of the welfare reforms they're proposing because they are hitting the poorest and the weakest. But I have to say to you that the SNP's record on child poverty is appalling. You know, figures are not just, progress is not just stalling, it is going in the wrong direction. They are not focusing on this because they are spending most of their time focusing on the Constitution. How can you expect a 3% cut in corporation tax to actually do anything about child poverty? You, know, you, cannot, have, you cannot have Scandinavian-style welfare with low taxation, and that's what the SNP are proposing. Um, let's just remind everybody that Ed Balls will vote for the austerity budget proposed by Westminster. <laughs> that austerity budget will put 100,000 children into poverty. It is shameful. And let's remember, we are the fourth most unequal country in the Western world, and that did not happen by an act of God. That happened by consecutive Westminster parties who did not put the children of this country first. Okay. When we talk about child poverty, we have to talk about why child poverty exists in the first place. In fact, why poverty exists in the first place. Jackie's right, we are a wealthy country. The problem is we don't use the wealth creatively. The wealth is upwardly uh, distributed. Right. Now, the reason for that, I argue, and we argue, is because of the way the economy is structured. We can't get away from this. And Labour are unwilling to come out and say this. Hi, uh, this one is actually for Jackie. Do you think when we're talking about debate and so many people having problems making up their minds um, because they don't have the facts or there's too much information, do you think it's democratic that the BBC on its online news stories does only has a better together link? Happy to answer that. I wasn't aware that they only have a link to Better Together um, because, because you'll, you'll appreciate I don't spend that much time online. Um, we, we, the, there was a recent panel where we were asked whether the BBC was biased and I have to say there are times where I've thought you know, they were biased against Better Together. There are times where, um, yes, Scotland have maintained... <laughs> Let me finish. Do you know, in the new Scotland, we don't shout each other down, OK? There are times where the Yes campaign where the Yes campaign will say the BBC is biased. I think, you know, on balance, we, if we are all shouting about it, then the reality is probably they're trying to be even-handed. But, but I genuinely don't know about the point you're making. But if it's true, then I don't think that's right. We haven't had any attempt here to discuss, to discuss the profit and loss of independence. And in fact, the loss is quite heavy. But are any of these people here actually interested in growing the economy, because we could grow the economy, we could do it quite easily if they wanted. We know how to make an economy grow. UK's policies are full of it. We can do that, but none of these people do, and, and very much those on the pro-independence side are very much against anything that looks like growth whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, clearly the, the, the tone of the, the question is a wee bit provocative, but it is a serious question. It is a serious question about what the nature of our economy is going to be like uh, if we vote for independence. Now, I am not someone who argues that economic growth, GDP growth, is the be-all and end-all. What GDP tells you is how much money is swelling around the economy. It doesn't tell you how that's being generated. Who is it benefiting? Who gets to suffer the social and environmental downside of the way in which growth is generated? So... Growth 
you know, ju just as a, as a single metric uh, is often misleading uh, and can often uh, occlude or, or uh, make us forget the other consequences of economic activity in, in the country. There's also an argument that in the long term, everlasting economic growth on a planet of finite resources is not going to be sustainable. So if something's misdirecting us and unlikely to be achieved, we should look at a broader range of ideas. The uh, Oxfam in Scotland have done that in creating a, a broad coalition of organisations to put together something called the Humankind Index, looking from first principles at what Scots feel they need to live well in their communities, and from that generating a set of economic indicators. Now, it's a first attempt. It's a group of NGOs and academics who've done it. It's not government, uh, but it, I think it, it leads the way uh, in terms of seeing the kind of economy that we could achieve uh, if we had the powers. I do believe uh, that we need an economy that is radically different from the one that we have now, whether it's owned industries that are owned lock, stock and barrel by the finance sector uh, and therefore can only be run with the interests of uh, already very rich shareholders in mind rather than industries that are owned uh, by small businesses uh, on a collective basis, on a community basis, or indeed on a public basis, that kind of uh, industrial policy would be far more likely to keep wealth, uh, whether, it's, whether we're going to be a little bit rich or a little bit poorer, I don't care. Frankly, I'd, I'd rather that we were a little bit poorer and a lot fairer. But we don't get to control... <laughs> we don't get to control how wealth is generated and for whom, in whose interests in the current climate, and I don't see any glimmer of a recognition of that fundamental problem at Westminster. I, I do find it ironic that the representative of the UK Independence Party that wants to pull Britain out of Europe, which would destroy jobs and wreck the economy, is, in, uh, is contesting that these parties up here don't have any idea about what to do on the economy and jobs. I do find that deeply, deeply ironic. Um, just a wee question for everyone in the panel. If you were compelled to make the best case that you could for the other side, briefly, <laughs> what would that be? I think there is a case uh, for the other side, and I mean that very particularly. If Britain um, had, over the last three decades, instead of privatising everything, invested. If Britain had decided to say, actually, George Bush, we're not going to war with you. If Britain had, for example, uh, sought an economic policy that decreased inequality, well, I don't think we'd have that big an audience here today so thirsty for independence. It's precisely because of those decisions that people are now so much in favour of uh, a, a yes vote, it would seem. And therefore, I think it's fairly impossible now to make an argument for a no. Was it always the case? I don't know. But now it's an impossibility to argue for a no vote on the basis of social progress. I actually have to suspend belief. But what I would say is this, if I was making a case for the other side, Scotland's a great nation. This is a, this is a huge risk. We should go into it with our eyes open. But actually, the Scottish people are capable of making a success of whatever hand they are dealt. And although that might be a considerable risk, although that might actually be one we have to be prepared to accept will be prejudicial to us, we should have the confidence, because we have the ability, to vote for an independent Scotland. That's how I would put it. I think we'd be more honest. I... Um, I, I I very much like that. I might use that line, Jackson. And, um, <laughs> but I, can I, can I in, in teasing Jackson, can I say that I think he is the kind of politician who, if there is a yes vote, will accept that in constructive terms and will seek to make the best he can from his political perspective. Not everybody's like that, but I, I, think, that's, I think that's fair comment. If I was arguing for a no vote, one of the things that I would point out, because there are risks... Uh, attached, as well as opportunities. One of the things that I would point out is that in fairly short order, a Scottish government without any uh, capacity, skill capacity in terms of running the currently reserved functions uh, would need to scale up very quickly. And there is a risk uh, that a Scottish government would be too tempted to buy in that capacity from external 
private consultancies. If I was arguing for a no vote, uh, I, would be, uh, I would be encouraging people to worry about that prospect. And if there's a yes vote, uh, those of us who don't want KPMG to write our tax code in Scotland are going to have to wrest some momentum away from the Scottish Government if it's tempted to go down that route. Again, health warning, suspend belief. Um, but small countries can be modern and successful. Um, they, they, they can actually be more attuned to the local population and their priorities and needs. Um, they do um, perhaps are more flexible, nimble on their feet. Um, we would have to recognise that the influence in the world might not be as great that we would have to recognise that the strength and stability of larger countries sometimes can give you security, but that risk is worth, is worth taking because we can have that much more local power. And as a Liberal, I'm attracted by the argument about local decision-making. I believe in decentralisation. I believe in communities having much more control, but I also believe in the value of partnership, which is why I believe in the United Kingdom. It's why I believe in international partnership. Um, so that's why I don't believe at the end of the day that that argument that I've just made is the compelling one. <laughs> but Because <laughs> as leaders, we have to put lots of health warnings on things, as you can imagine. Um, but, but actually, there are some arguments on the yes side that are attractive. And I can understand why some people find it difficult to decide in this debate, because the arguments are quite compelling, some of them. Um, that argument about local decision-making is, is a good one. As a Liberal, I'm quite attracted to that. But that's why you have to weigh up everything, and that's why, in my original contribution, you need to recognise some of the values and some of the benefits of the United Kingdom, and that's why, in the end of the day, I support the UK. Thanks, Willie. Uh, Tasmina? Again, to clarify, I was speaking for the other side. I would say, trust me. Trust us. Give us another chance to get it right. We'll do it right this time. We promise you. Because you know what? Independence is dead scary. Be frightened. I'm not quite sure that was in the spirit of the question, but there you go. Um, I, I have always and, and genuinely always believed in the sovereignty of the Scottish people. Um, so that's an argument I would make on both sides of this. Um, I do think independence is, is what you make of it. It may be, as Patrick said, that you make a choice about it being a poorer country, but a fairer country. Um, and that is something that, that people will ponder on. But I don't believe, and again, this applies to both, that actually there should ever be a debate about moving powers from one parliament and one set of politicians to another parliament and another set of politicians. I spent most of my life working in communities, um, and I've seen power sucked up by this current government away from communities. If anything, this debate should be about is how we move and shift that power back down to communities. That's an argument that is a challenge on both camps. The people who are on the pro-unionist side, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but in your speeches, I think all of you talked about how Scotland even if we didn't vote for independence, we'd get some more power. So do you guys see that ultimately we will become independent? Or is there a point at which we've got to, where, that Scotland can't have any more power? And at what point would you limit it? There, is, there are some people who say that they're against more powers because they believe inevitably you just get to independence. And that's part of the argument that the SNP have deployed, that this is a gradualist approach towards independence and eventually you'll get there. Um, my belief is that, um, that in this partnership arrangement we've got across the UK that needs to evolve and change over time, what we want to get to is the majority of the money that we spend in the Scottish Parliament should be raised by the Scottish Parliament and that means you have much more control over the size of the cake as well as how you cut it up. And in that way, if we want to do something different on the domestic agenda, then we can do it. We don't have to wait on anybody else telling us what to do, giving us permission we can do it ourselves because we can raise the amount of money that we need to in order to make that happen. I think that's the point that we want to reach. Now, there is a balance on all these things about how far you go, but my belief is that is the end point. 
So if we want to do it on the powers that we have, we want to do something different, we have the full tax-raising powers as well as the spending powers on the domestic agenda. And that way, we can determine our own future. We can determine our destiny on what is agreed in terms of the sharing partnership across the UK. I think that's the end point for me. I yeah. just I want to ask the yes side if, I mean, it's, it's okay to have like the heart for better welfare and better equality and all that, but, but do we absolutely have the economic assets? I mean, particularly the guy in the Green Party, you know, one of the main uh, arguments for the yes is, you know, North Sea oil. Mm. Are you confident or do you have any statistics that Scotland has the, the economic clout to support itself and to support the kind of welfare policies that you would support? Because I would support it, but I mean, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's all right supporting it with your heart, but if it, if it doesn't work out in pragmatic terms, then it's not going to actually happen. So do you, do you believe that, that we have the clout and the ability to support the kind of policies that you, that you advocate economically? Um, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. The, the two governments, the UK and Scottish governments, have been churning out their economic analyses, uh, and they'll continue to do that over the next few months, one trying to prove one case, one trying to prove the other. And the, the economic uh, information, the, the analyses that come out, are complex enough that both sides can tell their own story without actually telling lies. They can use the same bunch of facts and put a different light, a different interpretation on it, uh, and, and you know, come out with a different analysis without actually telling anyone any, any lies. Um, I think what they would all have to agree on, though, is that we are one of the richest countries in the world. And if we were independent, I, frankly, you know, if we moved from 14th to 15th or from 12th to 13th, um, I, I don't think that's the same as, as becoming economically unable to survive. Oil, at the moment, is, you're quite right, uh, a huge problem. And the SNP sometimes get annoyed and say, how dare people uh, suggest that the oil is suddenly a curse. I do think over-reliance on fossil fuels is a profound problem, not an opportunity. And we have to break that reliance, both in energy terms and economic terms. I talked earlier about the, the fact that something like 80% of the world's fossil fuels have to stay in the ground or at least be diverted to non-fuel petrochemical usage. We can't afford for that fossil carbon to end up in the atmosphere. Now, that means we've got a profoundly overvalued fossil fuel industry, and economies that are perched precariously on that industry are vulnerable. You've got a carbon bubble, and we know what happens when bubbles burst. Uh, if we're still riding this, uh, if we're still in this situation when the carbon bubble bursts, it will make the last eight years look like a broken piggy bank. Uh, we need to avoid this profound threat to our economy as well as to our ecology. Scotland's resources and Scotland's energy future lie in our abundant renewable resources, not just those that we've already harnessed, but the wave and tidal resources that we're years ahead of other places on the planet in terms of, of research and development. We've got the beginnings of an industry that will create jobs as well as exporting technology around the world and meeting our energy needs. We need to rapidly force that transition. Now, I don't see that, that scale of ambition coming from the SNP. I don't vote for the SNP. They've been good on renewables, but they've been absolutely every bit as committed to oil and gas, and we need to break that, we need to challenge it. But that's a problem at UK level as well. I don't see this uh, as being a, a difference between the UK uh, and, and Scottish governments. They're both fully committed uh, to the fossil fuel agenda, and anyone who shares my concern about that is going to need to challenge power, whether it exists in Holyrood or in Westminster on that question. Thank you, and thank you for an excellent question. I'm sure I won't be speaking out of turn if I say I think I speak on behalf of everyone across this panel who thinks that Scotland can afford to be independent. David Cameron has said so, Anna Sarwa has said so. I don't totally think that's the, the, the question. I think what's more at issue is what we do with the wealth that we have when we have control of it. I think we need to have the wealth in our own hands to have the correct spending priorities, the priorities that work for Scotland. Spending money on jobs, infrastructure, the living wage, the working wage, getting people back into work. Not £250 million a year on weapons of mass destruction that we don't want on the River Clyde. We can do better than that. In terms of um, the point about oil, 
Oil is only part of the equation. And if, even if you strip oil from the equation, our GDP per head is the same as the UK, even without oil. So the question is, let's have controls within our, within our own hands. And the suggestion that the Scottish Parliament's aim and ambition and job should be to mitigate what's coming out of Westminster is one of the biggest arguments to vote for yes. Yeah. The issue you raised was whether we could afford what we're being promised, and there have been numerous promises made about welfare. If you actually study the white paper, there's very little detail, there are no costings, and I just you know, worry that what we do is we promise things to people, but we then don't consider how we actually deliver on that. Um, there is a 12 billion deficit, not my figures. Um, these are for the Centre for Public Policy in the regions, independent of government. They make the point that oil is volatile. We know that. There have been huge price rises um, and huge uh, drops in price as well. In fact, the difference between oil at its lowest point and its highest point is the entirety of the budget of the NHS. So that should give us pause for thought about the volatility of oil. Um, they're saying that the deficit this year would have been 12 billion. The deficit over the next two years would have been 13 billion, and then it would have declined to a point of about five billion pounds. That's a deficit we need to close because we can't continue to fund public services operating at that kind of deficit. The interesting thing to note is they're predicting that whilst there would be a five billion deficit in Scotland, the reverse would be true in the United Kingdom. So we have an inbuilt deficit that actually should concern us. Um, I simply observed that the white paper said we were the sixth richest country in the world. Now we're the 14th. I don't know what's happened in the past few months, but that just worries me slightly about well, UK's the credibility. The credibility. UK's 18th, and you had the, the power to devolve welfare can, can with I just your say, commission. Listen, listen, you're not Nicola on television, so don't shout over the top. I'm simply of me. correcting the figures. I'm saying the UK is the 18th can I say country. To you, Scotland's can I say doing to better. You, really, you know, it, I, I think this demeans politicians to shout over the top of each other. But can I say to you, you cannot, at the one time, have you know, a strong welfare state whilst you're cutting corporation taxes by 3% more than George Osborne would. Um, and when the Parliament had the opportunity just last week, we were moving amendments on the living wage, on blacklisting, on zero hours contracts, on equal pay audits, really basic stuff. The SNP rejected each and every amendment. So I'll take no lessons from Tasmina about progress. One, one of the things I think that's missed out of the debate uh, when we talk about the economy is what is the UK economy actually based on? It's based on financial services. Mm. And if you base an economy on financial services, it means that you hinder your ability to invest. Now, let me just explain that. The reason that we are seeing the privatisation of our public services and of our welfare state isn't just because it's ideological, it's also structural. Because if you base your economy on financial services, you constantly need to find more and more markets to exploit, more and more places to invest in order to make a bigger return. So the question about the economy has to be dealt with in the terms of how do you manage an economy? Now let's take oil for an example. Why don't we invest the money generated from oil into green energy? That way you're making a positive impact with the money that you're raising. The other thing I want to be suspicious of, and I think that we should all be suspicious of, is when we hear governments quoting figures about jobs. Because politicians like to tell us about jobs and the numbers of jobs. They don't like to tell us about the conditions of work in those jobs or about how long those jobs might be there. <laughs> or about what their long-term benefit to the economy is. And I think that we need to have an investment programme into social useful jobs. We've got a social housing crisis in this country and we've got people that are unemployed with the skills and the trainable skills that could be building houses. Now, why the hell are we not doing it? There is a reason. And the reason is that our economy is based on financial services. Very last point on this. This is why, and I'd like to challenge the Conservative on the panel here on this point. This is why when we hear about economic recovery, it's entirely shallow. It's not based on the real economy. It's only based on the financial industry. Now, if that's the case, and I think it's provable that it's the case because our living standards are decreasing and the cost of living is increasing, how on earth can you get away with saying that a AAA economy now, now not a AAA economy, now struggling to get by, now under this false impression that there is an economic recovery? It's not. How can you account for this? 
Well, can I make an observation and answer your question in part? There's, there's a radical streak running through the audience now, a radical political streak. It's been part of the colour of all of my political life. I understand all the sympathy and support that Patrick has. Actually, for all that there's only one Conservative MP in Scotland, that one Conservative MP got more than the Green pa votes in his one constituency mm -hmm. than the Green Party got across the whole of Scotland in total. You know, when the Scottish Parliament was created, we were told it was going to be totally different from any other political parliament. It was going to attract a completely different base of politicians, not the mainstream political parties of Westminster, but something new and unique. Well, actually, it didn't work out that way, because Scotland is fundamentally a conservative with a small c nation. Even in its radical politics, it's relatively conservative. And so the economy of an independent Scotland is not going to be embracing the sort of radical element that is running through this hall or the radical politics that, that are part depends. of the colour of life. It's actually probably going to be a parliament much like the one that was just voted in in 2011 or one that represents the votes of 2010 or 2015. And that economy is going to be based on the mainstream. Now, I can answer that we're going to have the strongest growth of any country in the G8. I can say that we're recovering in the manufacturing sector as in the other sectors of the economy at the present time. But the fundamental point I think I want to make is there's no point in September in embracing a hope of some evangelical utopian Scotland which is removed from where the actual substance and heart of the people of Scotland lie. We're not going to have an agrarian economy. We're not going to move away with any main party that is elected from one which is based on the international mainstream that we currently are in. We're not going to have an economy that walks away from our markets or seeks to walk away from our markets in the United Kingdom or in Europe. That is the thrust of modern Scotland. It's going to be a big enough risk as it is if we, went, if we were to vote for independence. We're not going to tear up the economic model and start all over again. So I think if people think that's what independence is going to deliver, I think it's a, it is a form of self-delusion. I just don't see that. So I then, think the majority of people in Scotland, if we do vote to become independent, will want a model based on the economic model we have just now, but they'll probably want and believe that it can lead to certain different social outcomes and different influences in our outlook in the world. But don't believe just because radical politics seems appealing in a hall tonight where I recognise it's a large radical streak, that that is the kind of Scotland that's going to emerge if we're independent. It isn't. It's going to be a Scotland, the same electorate, voting the same politicians that are there today. We're not changing the electorate. We'd just be changing our constitutional status. So you can imagine the sign that says, Welcome to Scotland. Abandon hope, ye that are voting no. <laughs> and, that, and, that is ex and that response, that response is exactly my point. The White Paper has been mentioned a few times tonight, and I think uh, Jack has mentioned SNP more often than you, than you would get it in an SNP party political broadcast. <laughs> at, least, at least the White Paper is there, and I've been able to look at the White Paper. I know that Labour are going to be able to increase their tax, but not be able to decrease their tax. I've listened to Willie Rennie talking about promises, promises from a Liberal Democrat. Uh, <laughs> I'm just curious how students in England feel about promises from Liberal Democrats. I've also, I've also listened to a Conservative calling me a radical. And whilst I've got no problem with radicals whatsoever, I'm not a radical. But what I would like to ask the no representatives, or if they prefer to be called better together representatives, don't give us promises. Tell the 61 people who are going to vote no, tell the people who, are going to, who don't know at the minute, tell them what are you actually putting on the table if we vote no. Not, don't give us promises and don't tell us about Alex Salmond and the SNP. What are the Conservatives, the Liberal Democrats and Scottish Labour going to offer? What is it? I thought I'd kind of indicated um, already what was uh, being proposed. There is, I mean, the Conservatives have still to publish. Um, because I'm going to answer your question. I have to say, I don't think whatever I say will really satisfy me. 
Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm trying to address the answer to you. Um, so the Conservatives will be publishing their plan in May. Labour published their plan last week. We've published our plan. If you look at them closely, and I'm sure you've read them in detail, the plans that have been published. You're looking a bit quizzical, perhaps you've not. Um, but, the, but if you read the plans, you will see that there is an emerging consensus across the parties for more powers. But as I say, I don't think whatever I say will satisfy you. If you read them, you will see. But there is very little that I share in common with Jackson Carlaw about the vision of the kind of country I want to live in. Better Together will not provide you with a unified view of what we would offer. The individual political parties are putting their offers on the table. And actually, I think it's quite healthy. There's a degree of competition there about the nature of the powers that, that we want to see Scotland have. But that is a matter for the individual political parties. I think in fairness, you know, there is no commonality um, over a wide set of issues, social policy, economic policy, between radical independents, the Greens, and the SNP. Um, you know, the white paper, I'm sure Patrick would agree, um, not with every jot and tickle in it, Absolutely. because it is the SNP's manifesto. Yeah. So, you know, what you're asking of us, um, the other side isn't delivering either. It's the SNP's proposition. Um, you know, I, I, I have got to know Patrick reasonably well over the period in Parliament. That's not Patrick's proposition. Absolutely. He's much more radical than that. Okay, so this is a different question. Um, I just wanted to know if Scotland is going to uh, obtain its independence, what is going to be its relationship towards the European Union? For, I, I mean, obviously, Scotland won't be part of the European Union anymore. And, like, I'm a student, I'm not Scottish, but I am part of the European Union. and. Be, th this is why I don't have to pay fees. If Scotland is going to obtain its independence, will I have to pay fees after that? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we are all European here. We're all part of the European Union, and we are delighted that you are studying in Scotland and not requiring to pay your fees. And that will continue if the Scottish Government in the first Parliament of an independent Scotland is the SNP. And long may that continue. Student fees should be free for everybody. And I'm still waiting for the rest of the United Kingdom to follow our lead on that. It's Mr. Carlin made a comment about the electorates not changing. Um, it's going to be a constitutional change. As someone who's never felt, who's felt disenfranchised for my entire um, life as a voting adult, where my vote doesn't count in Westminster, why, why shouldn't we vote for a system where people who want to vote for people like Mr. Rennie's party, Mr. Harvey's party, actually get represented? Why should we vote to stay in a system where at Westminster we have Mr. Rennie's party get almost 25% of the vote and 3% of the seats? All of the countries of the United Kingdom, in fact, individually have had from time to time governments they didn't vote for. Uh, England hasn't voted for a Labour government other than on two or three occasions. Wales hasn't voted for a Labour or a Conservative government from time to time. So I'm making the point, over, over a longer period of time, um, yes, you can look, and I, I tried to say at the start, you know, the Conservatives had a majority in Scotland 50 years ago. I'm an optimist. Maybe one day we will have again. But independence should not actually, in my view, uh, be about whether or not you like the government of the day. It should be about actually some of the deeper issues that we were talking about, the values and aspirations you have for your country uh, going forward. All I tried to say earlier was that if Scotland does become an independent nation, we will have changed the status of the country, but it's the same people who are going to be living in it. And therefore, I think, you know, the expectation that somehow they're all going to vote in a more radical way, I don't think is, is likely. If I'm going to be provocative, then let me say this. Mrs. Thatcher got more votes in Scotland than Alex Salmon has ever achieved with the SNP. That's a statistical fact. In the I'm last, not in sure the last, that would convince no, me. In the, last sorry, general, yeah. in the last general election, the coalition parties, the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats, got more votes in Scotland than the SNP. Elections you know, produce all manner of different results from, from one election to the other. Independence is not about the outcome of a particular election, it's about the status of the country. 
can I uh, offer a, um, an attempt at a response to that? Um, do you know that if you look at the most socially deprived areas, that you'll also find that they are the areas with the lowest voter turnout? There are also the areas where there's the lowest number of uh, registered voters. And do you know why that is? It's not rocket science. It's because none of the mainstream parties in Westminster have any clue about the ordinary, uh, about, the ordinary uh, about people's lives and, and the things that people have to go through. And what it actually means is that often you hear on the media that there's apathy about politics, but it's not really apathy. There's apathy towards the Lib Dems. Well, not surprisingly, really. But there's alienation. That's the key, that's the key point. Yesterday we were in Drumchapel. We had 100 activists on the ground there. And we went round and we spoke to people. A few weeks ago, 80 people in Easter House at mass canvases, going round, talking to people, saying to people that their opinions matter and that this vote means something more than electing a party. It means something more fundamental about the structure of power that we have uh, in this country. And I'd just like to finish by saying that I wouldn't get too comfortable with the idea that radicals are some fringe element to all of this. Sorry. Actually, There's nothing. <laughs> actually, the proposals that we are putting forward aren't even that radical. They're basic human rights. And it's these basic human rights that we need back. What, what I want to move on to is I'm going to allow the opportunity for, for each of our speakers to make some closing remarks. In closing, I would say we can afford to be independent. We've got what it takes. Westminster is not working for Scotland. We have a government we didn't elect. We have Scottish MPs who rejected the privatisation of Royal Mail, rejected the bedroom tax, rejected Trident Renewal, and we still have it. Westminster is broken and we have an opportunity to make things better. The no parties cannot guarantee any further devolved powers. We haven't even heard back from Joanne Lamont in her Something for Nothing Cuts Commission. This is not as good as it gets. We can make it better. Trust yourselves, trust the people of Scotland to make the right choice. Scotland can be a prosperous, healthy, fair society in which our children and their children can live and enjoy life to its fullest. Thank you. Can I too thank you all for coming out? I actually think it has been invigorating and I think I agree this campaign about independence which is about an issue rather than the normal tribal party political politics has engaged the public in a way that I don't think um, many people fully expected and at one point looked as if it was going to be the case. We're going to have a pretty invigorating six months ahead. It's not whether Scotland could be independent. Of course it can. It's not whether we'll all fight to make Scotland a successful independent nation if that's what transpires. Of course we will. It's whether we should and whether in fact that is the best future that we can possibly have. I've obviously argued tonight and I recognise the sympathies in the hall largely run in a different direction that I believe we can actually have a far greater dynamic and say over our own affairs in Scotland, we can actually vote for change, but we can vote for that change and that new dynamism while staying within the United Kingdom and exercising a wider influence and being part of something bigger too. I think we can have the best of both worlds, which is part of what Better Together has argued for. And I think and hope and believe that that's what people in Scotland actually intrinsically want, to have that greater dynamic but to be part of something bigger at the same time. And in September, I hope that people in Scotland will vote for change, but change within the United Kingdom by voting to stay within the United Kingdom. Again, thank you for the opportunity to take part in the debate. And I'm sure that uh, I certainly hope that all of you will continue to be actively interested and participate in the debate over the coming months. Uh, it's not just about meetings like this. It's happening all throughout our country, very far from Scotland being on hold. Scotland, I think, is bubbling over yeah. with new and stimulating political ideas about our future. Jackson is right about a couple of things. Jackson is right that I'm in a small political party uh, that would be more comfortable uh, saying what we believe to be true and getting 5 or 6% of the vote uh, than selling out and having a big team of 15 or 20 MSPs. I'm... I'm someone... I'm someone who does have the nerve to hang on to a shred of hope, not only uh, that our species can 
get over and resolve the ecological crises that we've been creating for ourselves. And as I read the scientific press on climate change, it becomes harder and harder to, to sustain that hope. But we have to, because if we've got a chance of handing on a decent planet to the next generation, we have a responsibility to try. If we've got a chance of closing the gap between rich and poor, of wresting back some power from the unaccountable markets that are exercising power that should be democratically accountable, we have to try and achieve that. I see no chance of that transformation in our politics, our society, and our economy that is going to be necessary from Westminster. I see no guarantee that an independent Scotland will succeed. I only see the possibility that we can, and I want to grasp that. Like others, can I welcome the opportunity of having this debate, and I hope there will be many more to come as we approach the 18th of September. For me, it's always been about the fact that you know, what motivates me is social justice, fairness and equality. Constitutional change in and of itself doesn't end child poverty. Constitutional change in and of itself doesn't deal with fuel poverty. Constitutional change in and of itself doesn't deal with poor employment conditions. It takes political will, it takes a change to the system, it doesn't take a change to the Constitution. Um, for me, fairness, social justice and equality is delivered by political will. I do want the best of both worlds. I want a strong Scottish Parliament, but a growing Scottish Parliament. But I do want the security and stability of being part of the United Kingdom. At the end of the day, people will vote, but I hope they vote with their head as well as their heart. And I am very conscious that we live in a time where the world is an increasingly smaller place. I believe that I would prefer to see what unites us rather than divides us being the frame for the debate in the future. Thank you. Briefly, um, if you want to think back to when David Cameron made his plea uh, to the people of England uh, to phone up people in Scotland and tell them to stay, I thought there was something missing from that, and I think there's been something mis missing from the no side uh, this evening as well. There is no binding narrative uh, for the British state anymore. In mm. fact, the only narrative I think that you hear is attacks on benefit scroungers, is dividing people over where they come from, is the emigration vans, is time after time after time dividing people, and how then can those on the opposite side make the argument for unity when it is in fact the policy, economic and political, which has brought nothing but division uh, to working class communities right up and down the country, whether you're in Scotland or England. And therefore I think that given the debate that we've had and I started by talking about trying to relate to those of uh, you here who are undecided, to think through carefully about the arguments that have been made. Today we've talked about the economy, but we've not talked about currency. Why haven't we talked about currency? Why hasn't the No campaign today used their trump card and says you won't have the pound? Well, there's a reason why. Because the fear tactics aren't working. I don't know if that was briefed or if that was something that, that slipped your mind. Nobody asked the question. And, I, and the response is that no one asked the question. I wonder why that is. I think that the fear tactics aren't working and therefore, to finish, Unashamedly, the message and the slogan of the Radical Independence Campaign since its exemption is that another Scotland is possible and that we will make that Scotland possible, voting yes and using that as a platform for serious and fundamental change which people are desperate for and need. Yeah, yeah. Thank you as well. I think the debate has been a credit to Glasgow. I think your humour, your intelligence, I think some outstanding questions and the way that the panel, I think, has answered have been a credit to Glasgow and to this debate, so thank you for, for doing that. I don't know if Jonathan was listening, but I did mention the currency. I did mention it as one of the great benefits of the United Kingdom, and that is one of the benefits that I think I would like to retain. The strength, the security of the economy of the United Kingdom is something that we should not underestimate. Also, our influence in the world, the fact that we're one of the biggest, most influential countries in the world is, again, something we should not underestimate through good and through bad. I recognise some of the decisions the United Kingdom makes are not ones that I would have made, and I would like to revisit some of those decisions. But I don't want to break up the country in order to rewrite history. I want to try and get an evolving United Kingdom that serves people right across the country. I used to live in Cornwall. I lived there for seven years. The characterisation of people in the rest of the UK is not something that I recognise. I recognise them as people who have been through a 300-year journey with us together. And it's a 300-year journey that I would like to continue, because I think 
through good and through bad. It's been good for Scotland and good for the rest of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom will be diminished without Scotland in it. And I think it's a partnership that we should value because it's been good through good and through bad. So thanks very much for listening.